Welcome to God of Rock. This is Will Sanchez. Tonight I have two very, very special guests. Their names are Lauren Antonucci and her newborn Mia. Lauren is a well-known nutritionist in the tri-state area and a triathlete in her own right. So please welcome Lauren and the debut of Mia. <laughs> Thank you, Will. Thank you very much. She's uh, a month old. Excellent. I think he is definitely the youngest at Gattle Run. But let's get started by introducing the audience. Where were you born? What schools did you go to? A little bit about your family. Sure. I was born on Long Island, uh, so not too far from here. And then in terms of college, I went to Binghamton, went to San Francisco, to Berkeley for a little while for grad school, and then came back to New York uh, after that. Now, as a youngster, were you into athletics? I was. I would say I think I was born running and moving, always on the go. I think some people are just wired that way, and I'm definitely one of them. That's terrific. Now, when did you discover you had this passion for nutrition or food? Because you are now a nutritionist. Absolutely. I would say it probably didn't really start until college. Before that, I was just running around eating whatever I wanted, and I always liked fruits and vegetables, but I still still do, but always liked ice cream and chocolate as well. Um, and didn't pay too much attention to nutrition. My family ate pretty healthy, but it wasn't a big concern in any direction. Um, and then once I went to college, I think I really started to understand that nutrition was really important mm -hmm. from a standpoint of running and uh, seeing that we ate pasta all the time and thinking, well, that's probably not the right thing that we should be eating. There probably should be something else in there. Um, seeing some people have eating disorders, other people having stomach problems while they were running, and then some of our parents having medical problems and saying, you know, I really think nutrition is something that can answer a lot of these questions and really where I want to be. College, were you doing running or swimming or what was the athletic? Uh... I was running. I was a swimmer when I was a, a youngster and then uh, in high school was trying to do competitive running and swimming, which was exhausting, and then decided I really, really loved running and was uh, better at it. I competitively ran all four years in college. How does one become a professional nutritionist? I mean, you have all these uh, credentials. Sure. So we go cover some of these. Sure. So I guess there are two ways to do it. You could get an undergraduate degree in nutrition, but I didn't. I went in as a bio psych major. Um, so then after getting my undergraduate degree, I decided that I wanted to pursue nutrition. So I went and got a master's degree in nutrition. Either way, when you're done with one or both of those, then you need to go and do an internship, which is usually a year, uh, could be six months to a year, and you do work in a hospital, and okay. you do work in private settings, you have to do a food service rotation, so you have to work in some sort of kitchen, preparing and understanding how a food prep works for a few weeks. Um, uh, in a kitchen, prepared. you mean like in a restaurant situation? or That was in the hospital as well, oh, hospital absolutely. kitchen. <laughs> now, which, uh, which uh, college did you get your master's? From NYU. So after the internship, you have to sit for an exam, a board certification exam, a national exam. That's the registered dietitian exam, um, so that RD credential. Okay. And after that, I decided to work in a hospital for a while so that I could learn about all different kinds of situations and really become adept at doing many different things. Um, so I worked at New York Presbyterian Hospital for four years, and I worked with kids, I worked with adults, and I really found a few niches in cardiac and heart disease um, and in diabetes and helping those people with, you know, their high cholesterol, weight loss, watching blood sugars, all of that. No sports nutrition there. I mean, I think maybe I saw two athletes that happened to be in the hospital in those four years. Okay. Um, that I sort of just developed on my own because uh -huh. it was a passion of mine. Because you were a runner. Because I've always been a runner, right? And, uh, of course, why not get into sports nutrition? Okay. Uh, at some point, I know, but I think I met you through team and training. Mm -hmm. So were you a participant or were you the uh, nutritionist for the team? Participant, coach, and nutritionist. I joined, I guess it was 1999. I wanted to do an event for team and training. I said, I love running. I'm going to do a marathon for them because I might as well give something back. Went to the uh, meeting, the info session, and said, well, you're supposed to challenge yourself, and I've done marathons. So I signed up for a half Ironman triathlon borrowed a bike from some wonderful man on the team who had an extra one. And I said, I don't know if I'll like this biking thing. So I'll, I'll take this borrowed bike as long as he's letting me. Did the half Ironman, loved it. And ever since I've done both marathons and running and triathlons. Um, after that, I started doing nutrition for team and training. I coached their tri-team for a few years until my first son was born. And then uh, 
had to give that up because I couldn't do everything. Mm -hmm. Did you do a full Ironman at some point? I've done three of them, all mm. before the kids were born. So. <laughs> well, now I guess the obvious question is, is it more difficult to give birth or to do an Ironman? They're very different. I would say with the Ironman or a marathon, at least, especially the type of personality I have, you have a goal, you have a training plan, and you have a finish line. With giving birth, for me, all three of my kids were technically late, and that was the hardest part of the whole thing, right? You tell an athlete, you're done here, and then you make me run another four miles, right? The marathon's really 30 miles. That would be terrible. <laughs> so I think that was probably the hardest part for me. So I would say maybe the Ironman was easier. I bought a label, mm -hmm. and I think you have a copy of it. And I was very interested in knowing, you know, what to look for in, in, when reading a, 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 a label. So here, here's sure. uh, my copy. So, so I'm, an, I'm an athlete. I'm in the store, and, and I, I'm looking for a snack, you know, in between meals. Sure. And I pick up a bag, and I'm looking at the label. What should I be looking for? That's a really good question. Of course, there are different answers depending on what your goals are. Are you trying to gain weight? Are you running a marathon in three days? Do you have high cholesterol? But the long and the short of it, the first thing I would want you to do is take a look at the serving size. Because for this, it appears to be a bag of pretzels, or it was at some point, and it says a serving size is seven pretzels. If you're just not paying attention, you grab the bag of healthy-looking pretzels and start munching, and an hour later realize you ate three-quarters of the bag, which is five servings, then none of the nutrition information on the label applies to what you ate. Mm -hmm. So even if you looked at it and said, oh, well, this is three grams of fiber and three grams of protein and only one gram of sugar, that's not what you consumed. Mm -hmm. um, and if you were able to eat three-quarters of the bag of pretzels, that probably wasn't the best choice for your snack. You probably needed more like an actual sandwich because you were very hungry at that mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. um, so the first thing to look at is the serving size. And then I would say, see if that serving size seems reasonable. So you'd say, okay, seven pretzels. Do I think I'm only hungry enough to eat seven pretzels and I'll stop there? If not, you might say, well, I run a lot and this is a pretty healthy snack. And if I eat two or three servings, and maybe I know I've also eaten some fruits today and I had some vegetables and a piece of lean meat that this isn't replacing my lunch, then maybe it's totally fine. Well, as a snack, you probably would use a dip. So would... Uh... What would be a good dip with, uh, for example, cottage cheese or, or, or cream cheese be good? You went right for the healthy one. If you want to dip this in cottage cheese and get some protein and calcium, that would be great. I don't know how many people would do that. So you might be on the super healthy end. You'd be a very easy client for me. What about hummus? I would say hummus or salsa or black bean dips, which are a little bit spicy um, and low fat, low calories, really tasty. If you haven't tried one, they're definitely a way to go. Um, and you could keep them in an office and kind of grab it and snack on it. But sure, cottage cheese would work. I would stay away from the cream cheese, pretty high in fat. The nutritional value there is, is very low. Um, so go for something that's going to give you a little more bang for your buck. Well, there, there's something called tofuti. Have you heard of that? Mm -hmm. and now, is that better than cream cheese? I mean, it says on the box, better than cream cheese. <laughs> but when I look at the label, I saw it has trans fat. Right. Should I be concerned about that? Trans fats aren't something you really want to eat with any regularity. So if there are any trans fats in there, I would say that's not a product to be consuming often. Just because it's made from tofu or just because it's plant-based doesn't inherently mean it's, it's totally healthy. You know, you can go to a, a vegan restaurant and order an unhealthy fried dish. So don't let the fact that it looks like it could be healthy or the label says it's healthy fool you, which it didn't. So that's good. Right. Okay. But you say it's okay to eat once in a while, like once a week, because we do. My wife likes it. The tofu. The fruity, yes. Yeah. You know, I mean, if you go to the American Heart Association and look at the recommendation for trans fats, it's really as close to zero as possible. Um, there's a lot of research behind it showing even one or two grams of trans fat intake per day really increases your risk of getting heart disease. So not to totally scare people, but it's something we want out of our food supply. Well, you actually, you mentioned something because it is by serving. Mm -hmm. And I think the law allows if it's less than 0.5, they can put down zero for that serve. Correct. So if you have multiple servings, like most people who can only eat seven pretzels Which or who can only eat. Sure. So that trans fat really adds up because you're probably taking more. Because That's of the right. even though it says zero, there might still be some. That's right. So if, if you look at the food label, when you look at the bottom, and I sort of only have one hand for use, there are a lot of ingredients in here. Most people probably won't take the time to read through this whole list before they decide, hey, I think I feel like buying this bag of pretzels. And they're made with whole grains and they look healthy. If you're concerned with the trans fat 
even if you look on here and you see that it says zero, you can look down through all of these words down mm -hmm. here. And it doesn't matter if you can't decipher all of them. But if you see anything that's a hydrogenated or partially hydrogenated oil, there's a good chance that that zero is not really a zero for the trans fats. And you can assume that it's 0.5 and it would be a better assumption health-wise. Yeah. So then you'd say, okay, I'm going to eat 28 pretzels, which is four servings. This could be two grams. Right. Maybe I should pick a different pretzel okay. or a different snack. Okay. So you got to look at those ingredients too. Well, I have one more. Okay. This is one of my favorite snacks. Oh, no. <laughs> it's called, well, it's interesting. It's called a Will Bar. Okay. And I was doing the Portland Marathon. Uh -huh. And, of course, every marathon has the expos, and they were giving these away. Right. And what I liked about them was so moist. Mm -hmm. So, obviously, I bought a box and, and, and bought it back, and I bought many boxes since then. Uh -oh. and, and so I was looking at this. Well, first thing I noticed is a small size because it's a lot of calories. Right. Well, 230 calories for an active person like yourself might not be too much for a snack. Some of the athletes I work with need two, three, four hundred calories for their afternoon snack, especially if you're really training hard or maybe you're also cross training. Maybe you're also doing strength training or you're training for a triathlon at the same time. So you swam this morning, you're running tonight, you bike tomorrow. 230 calories for, you know, an inactive person trying to lose weight would be a lot. But for you, I think we're fine. The way I would really assess this, initially, it looks pretty good. Seven grams of protein, four grams of fiber, carbohydrates, 24, which is something you want as an athlete. When I look at the ingredients, we're looking at all real stuff. Peanut butter, flax seeds, oats. The only questionable one would be corn syrup, and you know we can debate that for as long as we want on whether we worry about that. Um, the trans fat says zero. The rest of the stuff looks pretty good. I think you're okay. What is it about corn syrup that's the big bugaboo? You know, that's really, uh, I would say, a... Because everything has it, power bars, uh, sure, cliff sure. bars. I think you can make a case for all different sides of that. Uh, you know, in someone like yourself, specifically, if you're eating a really healthy, well-balanced diet, you're not eating tons of products with a lot of refined sugars and unhealthy snacks and things, um, and you had a little bit of that in there, it wouldn't be a big deal. Mm -hmm. um, well, of course, you know, when I'm eating this, I'm also perhaps drinking Gatorade. Okay. <laughs> well, that could be your pre-workout fuel, right? So you've got your Gatorade, which is giving you carbohydrates and some sodium. You're fueling up. You get your fluids from the Gatorade. You have this. You've got a plan. Go for a run within an hour or two, and you're blazing the hills of Central Park. Okay. Should runners be carbo-loading before every, every, every long run? I get that question a lot. It's a good question, and people really struggle with it. I would say, you know, everybody's looking for that edge, and most runners like carbs. Most people like carbs. So if we can have an excuse to carbo-load, this is probably a fun thing. So I see a lot of people that over-carbo-load all the time, and then when they come to me is six weeks, eight weeks into their marathon training program when they say, well, Lauren, I've been training for this marathon, which is this wonderful endurance event. I thought I'd lose weight. I've gained five pounds because they're carbo-loading for every single run, the three-mile run, the five-mile run, oh, the 15-mile okay. <laughs> run. You clearly don't need to do that. I would say much better use of someone's time and a happier kind of way to be is to just take a look at what you're eating on a daily basis. And I highly recommend this to everyone, runners or not. Write down every single thing that you eat for three days. And, Will, if you've never done this, you should do it. If you're really honest, you start with yesterday. And you have yesterday and today, which are already gone. And then you just want to take a look at it. And runners typically should be having 60 to 70% of everything they eat from carbs. Now, you don't have to calculate that out. But just look through your day and you'd say, you know, do I see carbohydrates at every meal? Assuming you know what a carbohydrate is, which I know you do. Mm -hmm. So you'd see cereals and milk at breakfast. You see a banana for a snack. You might see bread or pasta with your lunch. There might be your Gatorade and your lovely snack bar before your workout. And then for dinner, we can pick something, rice and beans, or we can go for quinoa. We see some carbohydrates, of course, mixed in with vegetables and lean proteins. Um, so we want to make sure that we're getting those. If, let's say, you or another runner was getting those most of the time to the extent that they need them, you don't need to carbo-load too often. Um, and 
specifically women don't benefit from it as much as men do. So I'd say a better way to do it is just think about fueling yourself well mm -hmm. all mm -hmm. the time. And then as it gets close to say a marathon, possibly a half marathon, but really a, a marathon or a training that's very long, your 18 mile runs, think about eating a little bit more carbohydrate, maybe at each meal and snack for the couple of days leading up. So the way I explain that to people is usually, let's say for lunch, you tend to have pasta with broccoli and chicken. Mm -hmm. The last two days, maybe you skip the chicken or you do less chicken and you do a little more pasta or bread or a fruit mm -hmm. or a smoothie with it. And just gradually increase your intake of carbs before, but not go crazy and eat three bagels for breakfast and snack and lunch because those people that do that, it stores a lot of carbohydrate and water. Their muscles don't feel well. And then they wake up race day, their stomachs are kind of full and they just feel sluggish. Is hydration different for men and women? You know, they, men need to drink more because they're, they're heavier or, or, you know, how does that work? I mean, because men are typically slightly larger than women and have a bigger surface area, might sweat more, they need more fluids. But otherwise, it's really based on fluid sweat rate. So if you and I happen to sweat the same, we need to replenish the same. It doesn't matter if you're a man or taller or than me. I see. So if you lose uh, a pound of weight mm -hmm. after an exercise, mostly because of water loss. Right. So how much water do you need to replenish that? So the best way to do it would be, as you said, if you could or have access to a scale, weigh yourself before and after the exercise session. Um, before means right before, as soon as you're about to leave, not an hour and a half before. And then when you come back, it should really be immediately, not after you've drank your recovery drink and gone to the bathroom and all that. Okay, so you weigh yourself before and after. If you only lost one pound, then that tells us you should replace that pound with 24 ounces of fluid over the next two hours. But if you were going to repeat that run, let's say tomorrow or next week, with the goal of maintaining your hydration status during that run, you would say next time you do that hour run, you plan to drink about 16 ounces of fluid during the run to match. So if you're matching it during the run, it's a little bit less than you need to to replace. Oh, it's interesting. She has something to say about that, but yes, I don't I, know I, what it is. What's the recovery strategy? Should What, what should it be? And it, are there been any uh, new thinking about it? You know, I, I was just wondering if if your field changes or new, new, new thoughts or new experiments or new ideas sure. or better ways of doing things. So specifically the post-recovery phase. Sure. So you've probably heard of the recovery window, right? And there are basically two aspects to it. There's the first 30-minute recovery window, and then there's the two-hour recovery window. So tons of studies have been done on this over the years, and I don't think this will really change uh, because it's a an experiment in muscle physiology, and the muscles are what they are. Mm -hmm. um, so it's really important for any athlete, runners, when you're doing long or very strenuous depletion exercise. So just to clarify, if, if you and I went out for a 55-minute all-out very hard run, that could be pretty depleting. Um, so we'd want to really be replenishing during and after that as well. So it's not only the long runs, but any really hard or long effort. Mm -hmm. You want to get in, my rule is think about fluids, carbs, salt, and then a little bit of protein within that 30 minutes. And really, there are many ways to do it. Recovery drinks tend to be the easiest for people. They don't require refrigeration. Refrigeration Here in the city, many of us run in Central Park, Prospect Park. It's not like in a suburb where you run home to your house with your mm -hmm. refrigerator. Mm -hmm. So for a lot of people, if you can bring a recovery drink that's either ready-made or a powder that you can just mix with water, it works really well, as long as you have the calories for it in your daily calorie budget, right? So if, if you haven't trained too much, you don't need it. But when you start training pretty hard, most people have room for that. Yes. Um, so there are lots of drinks on the market that you can find that'll fit the bill for that. Um, and people can experiment with which ones yes, they like. Yes, you do. It. Make sure it's not uh, comp it's compatible with your, your, your system. It's That's different. right. And the recovery time, most people can tolerate a lot more than during the running time, so now, that's easier. Let me ask you about this uh, <laughs> this four to one ratio that you keep hearing. Although now I, I hear three three to one, that's the, the ratio of carbs to protein. Right. Apparently, a good ratio is four to one. What is that about? You know, I mean, I, I wouldn't say that I would advise anyone to pay attention to the four to one or three to one. Um, there are a lot of different studies done by different companies producing different products that are telling you 
everybody, athletes, um, that their ratio is the magic ratio. I think really the tried and true sports nutrition information that, again, has been out there and studied for a long time mm -hmm. um, is really that we need to replace our fluids first and foremost and salt and carbs. If you get inadequate carbohydrate, we don't need all that much protein, although some is probably beneficial. Um, and whether you get in four to one or three to one really is not going to matter at the end of the day. Yeah. You need to replenish. You need to get something in. Um, so it could be something like a recovery drink and a piece of fruit, and you definitely don't have to sit there calculating the ratio. Right, right, right. As long as there's a good amount of carbs. Right, right. I would say the biggest mistake I see for athletes in that recovery window is underestimating the amount of carbs they need. Uh, so people will grab one banana and think, I'm fine, but really they needed a whole recovery drink and a banana if they weren't about to eat their meal, their next meal, within 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so talk about that half-hour recovery. Mm -hmm. Is chocolate milk, I hear now, that's a very popular as a recovery drink. Is that... Uh... It is. It's a popular recovery drink. It's, it's again, a kind of a tough topic. You're going to find a lot of different answers on it. Um, there's really no magic to chocolate milk. Again, here in Manhattan, it's not really a practical option. And my concern with it is I see a lot of athletes, uh, they don't have one glass of chocolate milk. They go to the convenience store and they buy, without naming any brand names, but maybe a big, huge drink that's 18, 24, 32 ounces. It's not even actually chocolate milk. It's 450 calories. Again, I would probably stick to a sports drink, a recovery product. There are lots of them out there. Um, Gatorade makes one called Recover. Mm -hmm. A lot of them are starting to name them called Recover. Right, so it right. kind of helps when you're going there quickly. Yeah. You can pick that out. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Yep. You know, okay. you can experiment. Okay, well, you have to chocolate milk with your dinner as if you like it, the taste of it, I guess. Possibly. <laughs> okay, well, you talked a half hour window, now the two hour window. Does that mean to have a full dinner at, within those two hours? So, ideally, right, depending, maybe you're an evening runner, I'm a morning runner, I'm having breakfast within that two hours, you're having dinner, but a full meal within that two hours. And a full meal, of course, is different for different people, right? Okay. Yeah, people like to quote percentages, and I said in the beginning an overall diet for a runner might be 60 to 70 percent carbs. Right. The actual, the accurate way, the way I like to calculate, let's say, your protein needs or my protein needs is really based on grams of protein per kilogram of body weight. So the way I like to do it is get an absolute gram amount of protein. So Will needs 85 grams of protein a day. Um, and so whatever the percentage turns out to be, it turns out to be. If you're running 40 miles a week, the percentage of protein will be less than your weeks when you're running 20 miles, right? Okay. Let's say you're training for a shorter event. Somewhere around 20%. The higher mileage runners, again, their protein percentage will be lower because they just need a lot of carbs. Okay. Does that make sense? Okay, makes sense. Okay. It makes sense. That's, that's why nutrition got to go to school. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you have to like math, and it's fun. But to answer that question, that meal, it should be a normal, healthy, balanced, mi mixed meal. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So hopefully, of course, as you all okay. know, it would have some carbohydrates. Yeah, right. There would be a lean protein, which could be a chicken, it could be a fish, or it could come from grains, right? Okay. Now, and people shouldn't feel guilty if they have a pot and cream pie for dessert or, or some mm -hmm. kind of sweet. You know, my rule on that is really if you're getting everything you need in, we can sort of take 10%. And this could be for you, for me, for my five-year-old, anybody. If we're getting in our fruits and vegetables, we're eating healthy, you include the fish, you're active, 10% of what you eat, as long as there aren't too many trans fats, because we've sort of talked about how those are really not healthy yeah. for us, can be something that you really love. Ideally, it might not be the Boston cream pie. I'm pretty sure if we calculated how many grams of uh, trans and saturated fat, that's kind of high. Maybe more like sorbet or a piece of chocolate, okay. anything that's just okay. not totally unhealthy for you. Okay. Thanks. Once a month would be if it was a really unhealthy one, right? Like the Boston cream pie or let's say, sorry, cheesecake, right? Very high calorie, high fat, saturated mm -hmm. fat. Mm -hmm. But again, I think, you know, myself, you, anybody, if we're all doing it right and balanced, we all deserve a treat every day, and that's totally fine. Okay. And really what we don't want is we don't want people eating so healthfully that then they go out and eat an entire cheesecake or three <laughs> pints of Ben and Jerry's, which, of course, we know can happen, yes. and I see people do. So I'd much rather, you know, again, any of us think, you know what? I deserve a treat every day. There's nothing wrong with it. Work it into my healthy, balanced life. Enjoy it. And then, you know, you won't go crazy. I have a little piece of dark chocolate that's after perfect. dinner. 
Perfect. We can tout the antioxidants in there, and you can feel good about it. But the thing is, it should be controlled. You shouldn't eat the whole bar, right? <laughs> and that's really the key to anything. You know, there was a, a woman, and I, I don't remember her name, but if she hears this, uh, I'll appreciate. She'll appreciate it. One older woman in a hospital once, and I was counseling her husband, and I said, you know, you really can't overdo anything, right? So even if it's apples, if you eat too many apples, it's crowding out something else. And I said, you know, too much of anything is no good. And she said, except hugs and kisses. So we keep that in mind. Too much of any food. Hugs and kisses. Hugs and kisses, all the, all unlimited. That's great. All right. Food, I, uh, even if it's a healthy one, uh, moderation. Okay. And seasonally, vitamin D is an important one, especially where we live in the northern latitudes. We really can't make enough. Even if we all went for our run outside with our arms exposed, if it were warm enough, from the fall through about February or March, we can't. The sun's not strong enough. We can't produce the vitamin D through our skin. So it's probably important for most people, and specifically runners, to take a vitamin D supplement. Um, if anyone's concerned, they can get their vitamin D level checked at their doctor. It's pretty simple to do. Mm -hmm. And then once we look at what someone's vitamin D level is, there's a pretty easy way we can recommend how much that person should take. So per amount that you take, there's an amount that we would expect your vitamin D level to raise over mm -hmm. a couple of months mm -hmm. or to maintain. Um, another thing that's not seasonal but really important for runners is to get their iron status checked mm -hmm. um, and really make sure that that is on track. Um, I wouldn't recommend supplementing with iron on a whim or just because we're talking about it now or just because you're a runner because too much can be dangerous. Uh -huh. But if someone's feeling really tired, lethargic, getting injured, definitely go to the doctor, get a checkup, have the levels checked. Um, and iron is something that often can be low in runners and really should be monitored. Hmm. Yes, because I, I, it's one of my friends said that the doctor said she, she was low in iron but not anemic. Right. So it's one of those, it doesn't mean you're anemic, it's you're missing something. Right. And so it's a question of, you know, do you need to be anemic before it can be a problem? So whenever I work with someone, I would always like to take a look at their lab values as well and kind of help say, well, from a sports nutrition perspective, this is still technically within normal limits, but this could become a problem as this person is running more and they're sweating a lot and we lose minerals and things through our sweat and, you know, they're increasing pounding, which breaks up red blood cells. So we say, you know, this is low enough that we might want to supplement and follow up with this in a few months. Thank you so much for educating us and coming by with Mia and sharing these terrific tips. You're welcome. It does go by really fast. You're right. I feel like we have so much more we could talk about. <laughs> but thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you, Will. This was fun. And Mia thoroughly enjoyed it. <laughs>